fans welcome to another edition of the peristyle podcast on a tuesday if you're watching us live on our youtube channel over at inside troy appreciate that and you can see i'm alongside chris trevino follow him on twitter at chris n trevino we are back uh, in la we're back doing another live show here on the peristyle podcast a little hour early if you're local the 11 a.m local time Got some radio uh, stuff I got to do. Chris has got a bunch of stuff going on. So we moved it up a little bit, but we appreciate you if you could be in the chat with us. Uh, put your questions in there. It's going to be a mega mailbag episode because it's end of June, not a lot going on. We got some stuff to talk about. Talk about USC's latest commitment, uh, four-star wide receiver athlete, uh, Ryan Pelham from Millican High School in Long Beach. I got to see him a few weeks ago live, and we got some video of that. Also some NCAA versus NIL collective things going on. SI was breaking some news on that this morning so i want to talk about that and of course uh the mailbag stuff where we chris went onto twitter and solicited uh questions we do i think we got an email or two and if you're in live in the chat if you just put question uh, i will start we can get to it later so we'll just have a lot of questions today chris for for the fans there solicited is a dirty word it has like <laughs> negative connotations so i was uh yeah, I guess I was soliciting questions, but it just sounds a little salacious. Uh, but yeah, definitely. Uh, mailbag episode. We haven't done one of these in a while, so I'm excited. Other update. I have my laptop with me today. <gasps> I'm back on the laptop. And because I thought about it, I'm, I'm not going to let this podcast chat or Tunnel Vision chat bully me into not bringing my laptop. So I've decided to be back on the laptop movement during podcast because just because it's live doesn't mean i shouldn't have something in front of me that makes me more prepared so yeah i'm back on that that wave yeah last week when the commitment broke and it was just sort of like chris was a little scrambling on his phone i want to give a little shout out to jay jones all right he's a hey trojan fam from landstuhl germany so very cool. So it's it's uh, it's later there, Chris. So you can't call him like a Germany. USC just offered a kid that's from Germany, plays in Georgia now. But yeah, twenty twenty five offensive lineman. So Germany coming up big for the Trojans this yeah. week. And uh, Ryan Yount is uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. Do you know where that is? Let's go. I've heard of it. He's yes. from from Long Beach. So Let's go. Shout out there. But yeah, well, I'll uh, try to put your comments up uh, on the screen if you're watching live on our YouTube channel. If you're listening on the podcast uh, later on. Yeah, you don't get to see those, but we'll kind of talk about some of the funny comments and stuff. Put them up there, and like I said, questions, uh, if you got them, put them in the chat, and I will star them. We'll get to them uh, later. If you want to send us an email question for a future show, for this show, for the Composite Two-Star Recruits, for me with Harvey Hyde, uh, any of the shotgun shows, you can do it at podcast at uscfootball.com. That's the email address. That's where we send most of the questions, or you can call or text us. Leave us a voicemail. Send us a text. 424-254-9141 is the number. And if you have the Apple Podcasting app, we always push this. Please leave us a five-star rating and review. And you can follow us over there at the Peristyle Podcast. And we got a new review. It's been a while. Chris. So I'm really excited about that. Yeah. It's a little, like a month or so since we had a review. But it's five stars from Alex. Uh, we're so back. He says, long-time listener, first-time reviewer, big fan of the show, especially the two-star. Shout out to you, Chris. Let's go. He also says, shout out to Jack uh, Willer, who put me on to the Peristyle. That's a, that's a great point. If you have USC football friends and family around, let them know uh, about the Peristyle podcast. And of course, uscfootball.com. It does help uh, grow the show. But uh, yeah, put them on to it. I'm sure they'll enjoy it. And if you are not a member, you know, you're watching the show now you know, live, 11 a.m. here on the West Coast. Maybe 2 p.m. on the the, the uh, East Coast, wherever you're watching or you're listening. 
If you're not a member of uscfootball.com, we have a few days left uh, of our 50% off sale. So we're doing it throughout June, half off an annual membership. You will not regret it. You'll be the most informed Trojan fan in your circle for sure. And there's a lot of entertainment value just reading the posts on the Peristyle. When a recruit picks USC, when a recruit picks a different school besides USC, just very entertaining. There's a lot going on over there, Chris. So make sure you get in there. 50% off uscfootball.com. It's going to be a busy day today, so I hope you guys uh, can come join us on the uh, the Peristyle. Ah, so later on today, make sure if you if you don't have a membership, get in there, fire it up. If you got one, dust off the password if you haven't used it in a little while. Get over there and check out the Peristyle because there'll be a lot of stuff uh, going on. So we appreciate all of you that are subscribers, and if not, you can be one and uh, you will not regret it. Also, want to thank our sponsor, um, for a long time, Trader Joe's. Funny that you uh, bring that up, oh. Ryan, because okay, Chris. this is a mailbag podcast. Obviously, a lot of questions. We did get a question from Giovanni, who actually asked multiple questions, but he did have a fun question that plays into Trader Joe's and our sponsor. He asked, top three items to have at your tailgate from Trader Joe's. So I'm mixing in the theme with the sponsor. I like it. Okay, so uh, I got a couple right next to me, to be fair. Um, so I will. I can give you guys visuals. ASMR. Yeah, uh, rolled corn, tortilla chips, chili and lime flavored. Uh, these are really tasty uh, and a little spicy. You like a little spice, Chris? You're not oh, a big yeah. spice guy. No, but... I mean, I do enjoy some heat. I do uh, enjoy some they're heat. They're really good. And this is one, um, when we first started doing uh, the show... Uh, like Trader Joe's would give me kind of scripts to use before we started just kind of saying whatever we, we liked and they like what we say. Uh, but this was one they told us. The Organic Elote Corn Chip Dippers. Mm. Um, these are really good. Uh, Mexican style, street corn flavored, uh, really good. Like you show on the package, you can dip them with guacamole. Um, I just eat them plain. Like they're a way, they're a lot more flavor than just like tortilla chips. Um, Man, they're really good. But and I also go to TraderJoe's.com. You know I love me some sweets. And this this doesn't even seem right. And for me to say that, I don't know. That's something because I can do sweet all you want. But it's the dark, dark chocolate peanut butter cups. Oh, yeah. But you make the brownies and put them on top. So but the this is, so the ingredients in there, they give you um, recipes. Basically, it's just you take the Trader Joe's truffle brownie mix with some eggs and butter and preheat the oven to 350 and you make the brownies and then right before they're done you put the upside down peanut butter dark chocolate peanut butter cups on top and then they put it back in the oven for a couple of minutes and they start melting and you basically make like a uh like icing out of the, oh man they look go to the website they look ridiculous so uh those instantly uh you know jumped up to my uh in my top three um, just throwing it out there because we're talking about tailgating. We're talking about Trader Joe's. Is this our next Bake Off? Is this our next Bake Off? Like a brownie, brownie bake off? Like a bounty, brownie Bake Off. I, I th I'd be down for that. I, do I, I just want to warn you, I make a mean brownie. I got a really good brownie recipe. I make a mean brownie. I Remember. won't even use the Trader Joe's one since that's cheating. I will, you know, because that's a mix. But we have to use the ingredients from Trader Joe's, correct? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, anything. So... I mean, if chat wants to see it again, round two, I took you down, Ryan. Uh, That's controversial, but yeah. I mean, not to me, baby. <laughs> not to me, baby. But a lot yeah, of people I mean, go, well, yours were better. Why yeah, did you yeah. yeah. <laughs> one, find me one person that said that. But, uh, but yeah, Trader Joe's tailgating, uh, our annual tradition, it seems like. Maybe maybe we'll get this brownie thing going for a game this uh, this year. Final in the Pac-12. I would love that. Okay, let's do it. Um, all right. So let's get into uh, some of the stuff. And we have a little bit of uh, uh, breaking news. USC picked up another commitment uh, on Monday. And so when I got to see in person fairly recently, uh, Ryan Pelham, there's a photo I took down there at uh, Millican High School. Guess where he's from? He's from Millican High School. But they had a tournament down there. And um, I think his team made it to the finals, if I'm not. Uh, if I am not uh, mistaken, but he played both sides of the ball when I saw him. Uh, they list him as a wide receiver, uh, 5'11", 170 pounds, got some track speed. Uh, you, he committed to USC on Monday. Before Chris, he wasn't even in 
like USC, he wasn't even top 10. USC didn't even have, like, he, he didn't have USC in his top 10. And now uh, the Trojans pick up uh, the commitment from Ryan Pelham. So if you want to give some thoughts on that. Yeah, Ryan Pelham, 5'11", 170 pounds, uh, number 100 overall prospect in the 24-7 sports rankings, number 19 wide receiver, gives USC 13 commitments in the 2024 class. I expect that to grow by the end of this week, but 13 as of right now moves them up to number 8 in the uh, national rankings, number 2 in the Pac-12. I know everyone gets mad about the Pac-12, but holds them steady at number 4 in the Big Ten Right on the heels of Oregon at number seven there, but that could change by the end of the day. But Ryan Pelham, really good pickup, number 69 overall in the 24-7 sports composite. Nice. Uh, a couple nices in the chat. But Ryan Pelham, good local pickup. Pair with Xavier Jordan, who is also a top 100 prospect in the 2024 cycle. Gives them two wide receivers. And once again, building another really good wide receiver class. He was, you know, kind of considered an athlete prospect coming up because he could be a high-level cornerback or wide receiver at the next level. Uh, one of the comps, I talked to Greg Biggins. I did a future impact piece about Ryan and his commitment yesterday. But one of the comps he came up with was, you know, a little bit like a Gary Bryant kind of player. You know, he can be a game-breaker on special teams. Maybe not as high top-end speed, but he can take the top off of defense. Has the versatility to play inside or outside Feels like maybe he'll be a more inside player, but does have the, the capabilities of playing outside. And yeah, you're right. USC wasn't considered in that top 10 when he when he brought that out. But uh, as Greg pointed out, he, he thought that was more so because of a miscommunication between both parties. You know, Ryan Pelham didn't know USC was interested. USC didn't know Ryan Pelham was interested. And once they got in a room and talked it out, got him on campus, they felt like, oh, we both have interest in each other. And then USC immediately became a top school. So they beat out Oregon for Ryan Pelham. A couple SEC, SEC schools were involved as well, but this was a USC-Oregon battle to the end. Took an official visit for that golden hour weekend with a bunch of other wide receivers that were on campus, including Xavier Jordan, the commit. But yeah, USC beats out the Ducks for a local good, really good wide receiver. And USC is now, you know, building some really nice pass catcher classes the last two cycles. For sure. And if you're watching us live on YouTube, I've been showing uh, about uh, two and a half minutes of highlights that I shot of uh, Pelham at that seven on seven tournament at Millican High School. And if you're watching him, you can see the speed. You see him backpedaling, uh, playing like a safety spot. And you know he had an interception in there. Um, he had a couple passes defended and then. Catching balls on the on the offensive side. Oops, sorry. I had yeah, I was like, why, why, why are we on me not and saying I'm anything? Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, and you know, seeing him catching a whole bunch of touchdowns, two point conversions. Uh, it seems like when the offense was doing well, it was going through Pelham, and he never came off the field for that tournament. And he was just, you know, he would go. And the way those work is like, you know, you're kind of meandering down the field if you're the offense, and you know the defense is playing, and you're moving down, score, you get a stop, whatever, and then. When as soon as that drive is over, because it's basically like a usually like a twenty five minute running clock, so they don't stop the clock when you score. The when you're you know your defense is playing defense, whatever, and you give up a score, or whatever it is, your offense is already lined up, you know where you had started the initial drive, and the the opponent opposing defense is already lined up. So the next drive is ready to go as soon as like the you know you go three whatever you uh, have to punt or uh, you know turnover and downs or you score. So Pelham would be like, say he catches a touchdown pass, then he like has to start immediately running back to go play defense on the other side. Um, so yeah, it was it was fun to kind of watch him out there, and I hadn't really seen him in person, but you know, just watching him, like, all right, that's someone that USC needs, and uh, got to interview him and kind of talk to him about you know his schools and everything, and um, I think it's important to get a, a highly ranked local player for sure. A highly ranked local player that Oregon's interested. Another, you know, another little check there. So I like it putting USC back into the top ten, up at number eight. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's all it's positive there. You know where the Trojans are, and like you mentioned, uh, right behind Oregon at number seven. And a lot of USC fans don't care because Ryan Pelham's not going to be playing against Oregon. He's going to be playing against Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, which. Um, those teams are, I think, uh, two and three for Ohio State and Michigan. And then uh, Penn State's number six. So Penn State's certainly 
uh, could overtake uh, USC can overtake Penn State, but all three of those Big Ten schools are recruiting well, and USC's right up there with them. I actually just needed to get your perspective as one Ryan to another. Ryan Pelham, Ryan Abraham. What are they getting as a Ryan, as a human being? I mean, just cool. Like Part of this job, which is fun, is just getting to talk to some of these kids and how mature they are. And just, you know, they've been interviewed a bunch. They're on this, this high state, you know. Just seems like a great kid, you know. Obviously, the name impeccable. You can't get much yeah. better than that. Uh, but yeah, he was really fun to talk to, really uh, personable, and uh, it's, it'll be interesting to kind of see, you know, what he's able to do when he puts on the Cardinal and Gold uh, jersey uh, in 2024. But yeah, seemed like a great kid, and I think we're lucky here being in Southern California. There seems to be a lot of mature, um, you know, just guys that kind of know what's up, uh, and you know, you just feel like. They're not going to be at some kind of dis- – you know, they can you know, speak with the media. They can uh, communicate with their teammates and coaches and all that. Just seems like he's uh, you know, kind of a well-rounded kid who's really good at the football. And he does track stuff too, right? Yeah. Is he, yeah, he's a track guy too. Um, so, yeah. And you know, here's – I'm going to put this up from David. Uh, he says, oh, he feels good stealing recruits from Oregon. I don't know how you think of like a Long Beach kid being stealing a recruit from Oregon. Cause yeah. Okay. Maybe Oregon was a favorite for a while or whatever, but those should be USC guys, right? Oregon was the one coming in doing the stealing. And I think now you're just kind of preventing, you've put up some security loss uh, prevention. Yeah. So uh, don't, you know, Oregon obviously recruiting really well. Um, you know, they've had great 15 year run, whatever it's been, it's been a long time. Oregon was doing well. So, but I wouldn't classify it as stealing a recruit from Oregon. It's more like Oregon's been stealing at will from USC. And uh, they had that, like, that, you know, uh, elderly security guard that doesn't, you know, has like a flashlight sitting in the corner, not really doing anything if armed robbers <laughs> come into the store. You know, now you got, you know, more high sophisticated security systems. You got cameras. Uh, maybe you got like a ninja there with some nunchucks ready to stop. You're saying a, a Paul in. Blart kind of guy. But, <laughs> but, in, but in Paul Blart's defense, he did save. The mall in that movie, but yes, um, he did. Yeah, I was actually going to say, and I just forgot what I was going to say. Something about oh, because his name is Ryan, does he automatically become your boy for the class? Is that how that works? Um, you know, it's sort of a feeling you get, Chris. Oh, okay, yeah, it's hard to say. I would say, um, yeah, I, I enjoy talking with him. I'm not like you guys are going to all the events. As I'm getting older, I'm going to less recruiting events, which sometimes I regret that. I want to go to more. But when I go to one and you kind of connect with the player, like um, Xavier Jordan, I had a really fun time talking with him too. I did a video interview with him. Uh, next time I see Ryan Pelham, I would like to – I'll do a video uh, there too. But um, those are fun because you can kind of do the stuff on camera. Like I went out to Bishop Gorman um, and, you know, was able to talk to Zachariah Branch and Zion Branch, you know, when Zion was a senior there going in there like in their summer – Doing those video interviews are fun. I think you get, you know, you can see that you can see each other. You're just talking on camera. So I'd like to do that with uh, Ryan Pelham. He's potential, potential to be. He's going to be at the Polynesian Bowl. So yeah, that's. I usually connect with the guys there because I like. I go to Hawaii. Like I don't skip recruiting events in Hawaii because I'm not an idiot. He can do an annual. Uh, I mean, that was kind of felt like a shot at me because uh, I have skipped uh, multiple times to go to the Polynesian Bowl. But Ryan does an annual. Uh, interview with someone at the Polynesian Bowl. So maybe uh, Ryan Pelham and Ryan Abraham will connect once again. Yeah. We usually do interviews. Um, they're funny. Well, this year it was uh, Zion Branch and uh, who's the, the, why am I blanking on the, the corner that went to Oregon? Um, the, what's his name? I need a little more specific. No, he, the, the, he was at the Polynesian Bowl. I had Zion Branch interview him. Why am I blanking on it? Rod, Roderick Pleasant. Roderick uh, Pleasant. Yeah. And that was a really fun that was a really fun one. You had Zach Branch. Did I say Zion Branch? Yeah. Zach Branch uh, interview him. Sorry. A lot of branches. There's a bunch of branches. A lot of Rodericks. A lot of speed. Yeah. That I was a lot it. of fun. I get it. Um, but yeah, we try to do stuff like that. But that'd be great. Um, it, it usually, and it's good because you should get a bunch of West Coast kids that get out to uh, Hawaii. And then we can, you know, you see them in like a different environment. And uh, you can talk to them about, you know, a lot of them first time on a, you know, plane ride that long. First time going to the islands and things. So uh, it's good. Um, and it's a great, you know, those kids that go out there, I think they, they do it really well for the Polynesian bowl and, uh, certainly expand your horizons. And, you know, I think Pelham will have a good time out there. 
All right. Anything else on Pelham? No, I think we covered it. The uh, so if you Ross Dellinger has got a great job over at SI, um, and uh, he was tweeting out some stuff this morning. If you want to go check out his stuff, but essentially, the NCAA are saying that schools need to follow rules uh, for NIL and collectives, like the NCAA rules. Even though all these states are putting out different state laws that are allowing things like, oh, you schools can work with the NIL collectives and you know give money to high school players to come to the school, like state. There's so basically state laws, especially ones in like college town states that are you know big. You know, basically it's like the biggest thing in the state. They're trying to give their state schools advantages over maybe their rivals. Um, and so there's a bunch of states that are passing these different collective laws. And the NCAA came out and uh, were basically saying, nope, you can't do that. Um, even They're saying even ignore the state laws because the NCAA is a, it's a, you know, it's a volunteer organization. You guys all chose to be part of the NCAA. You don't have to be. You chose to be. And these are our rules. And it wouldn't be fair if uh, a rule in Arkansas gave um, an advantage over LSU because Louisiana doesn't have that law. Um, so essentially, that's what uh, the NCAA is saying. How much teeth do they have? I don't think they have any, but this is they're coming out there. Uh, and they're also going after the collectives themselves, saying, like, if you're an NIL collective and it looks like you're closely associated with the school, you're still a booster group. You can't give uh the school can't give you benefits for donating to this nil collective because that's you know impermissible and apparently i believe what the story is at texas a and m so you know closely associated with their collective they've been on the forefront of all this we're offering like you know upgrades to your season tickets things like that like incentives if you do give big donations to their collective so that's not even like hey i'm gonna like Donate to your school. I'm joining Cardinal and Gold, whatever these alumni associations are. Um, you know, and now you can get. Oh, you can now go from season tickets in this section to this section. There, the NCAA is saying you can't do that. So Texas A&M was you know, been pushing the envelope. There's some schools that have been pushing the envelope, but they are saying like those collectives, even if you're a 501c3, basically a nonprofit, like uh, one wing of the House of Victory is, um, you can't provide benefits for donors and they're also saying you still can't do inducements you can't say to a high school player we're going to give you this nil money if you come to the school um you can't do that you can't promise you know nil money from high school prospects you can't say here's your nil con nil contract but it's only valid if you go to this school the the one that the collective is associated with so it was some pretty strong language they did kind of a q a thing uh you know I, you can go read through it but basically saying like, nope, you can't do this the way these collectives are going. Um, even I think the like normal collectives, uh, and the way USC is doing it, I think follows most, if not all of these rules that the NCAA is, is kind of finally giving clarifications on because they're only providing benefits for current student athletes. So I believe what like USC is doing with House of Victory is in line with everything. And, I'll, and this just happened before we recorded. So I'll, I'll double check with our, our contacts over at House of Victory to make sure. But I believe from what my understanding is of House of Victory, everything they're doing is compliant with this. Um, but there's a lot of schools that aren't. The schools that are getting high school prospects to or transfers to come to the school, promising them NIL money um, and all of that. So it's pretty, I mean, the wording is strong from the NCAA and they have a new president now and everything, but I don't know. They've just never been able to enforce anything and it never really has any teeth. But uh, any thoughts on, on all this, Chris? It sounds like you're uh, moving in on the composite two-star recruits. Uh, talking points here, right? Really? Yeah, bringing up NIL, uh, oh. everything in between. That's that's our tagline for the show. Okay. But uh, yeah, it, it is an interesting move by the NCAA. The only winners in all of this are going to be the lawyers for the states and the NCAA. And you make a good point about the NCAA's point about them being, you know, volunteer. You opted into this. That kind of opens the door for schools to say, okay, peace out and yeah. leave. <laughs> and yeah, it really 
I mean, we've we've talked about and heard about, you know, will there even be an NCAA in like five years or 10 years of college football? So maybe this is an accelerant, this letter and this telling them, you know, you can't do this. And try telling an SEC school state legislator or, or state, uh, yeah, a state uh, legislation. Yes, legislation. That is the word. T- try telling them you can't do this for helping their college football program. And it's like, yeah, the, the gloves are about to come off and things are about to get ugly. Yeah. And it, I mean, politics get involved in this. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Because politics makes everything better, right? Right. That, but, you know, is it a coincidence that a lot of these SEC schools, their state laws are passing it? So if you remember, the first state law that was uh, you know allowing NIL uh, money for, you know, student athletes was California. But it was like... You know, it was just kind of like all the red tape stuff. This is going to happen in 2023. This was like three years ago. And then other sco- like other states kind of figure out like, hey, that's actually a good idea from, you know, like Florida calling California like this hippie liberal state or whatever. But Florida goes, yeah, let's do that. And let's do it like right now. So they they accelerated the process. They, they adopted an NIL law and they pushed it up for like, I think it was like 2021 or something. So that forced, and other states started to do that, forced the NCAA to like give out that memo basically that said, yeah, here you can do NIL. Just don't do this, this, and this. Um, it was really dumb on the uh, NCAA's part because they waited so long and so long to do this. But California, if I'm not mistaken, is like suing USC and the Pac-12 for not sharing revenue, athletic department revenue with the student athletes. Um, so basically going after this. Now, that's like kind of the next step, right? We're going to probably see Athletic departments have to share, you know, revenue with student athletes, but California is not doing this for helping USC or UCLA or anything. They're doing it to, uh, you know, it's more like, Hey, we're, we want student athletes, uh, all their rights to be in place, which is kind of going to make the rest of the country probably, you know, follow suit. It's, we're going to get there, Chris, we're going to get to the point where there's going to be revenue sharing and stuff. Again, the NCAA is avoiding that, but States in like the SEC world are trying to pass laws to help their schools recruit. Right. Like that's not what California is doing, but they are pushing more of a, you know, like anti, uh, you know, we don't need water, you know, uh, waterfalls in your, uh, you know, locker rooms. We want the players to get paid. Um, they're not caring about if USC and UCLA can recruit better, but those, a lot of those SEC schools, the, the state laws are essentially passing like, hey, we want to help LSU. Let's pass a law. Uh, to do that. But the NCAA is saying, no, 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 state laws don't matter because you chose to be here. But will they peace out? I don't know. We'll have to see. You've uh, piqued my interest. Tell me more about these waterfall locker rooms. That's always just the joke uh, and how much, basically you get all this money, you know, your athletic department gets this huge budget and you got to pay coaches and uh, buyouts and all those kind of things, travel. But then they're like just dumping money into, I think it was Texas that announced new lockers and it was like each locker is is like eight grand and you know you would put a playstation in there and all this kind of stuff but like they just got new lockers like six years ago it wasn't even that long for usc the you know they announced new plans we don't know when they're going to come out like the john mckay center i mean it's it's nice but it was like it wasn't built to like the college football like college football was changing and the scale was changing and USC did not have the vision to realize like what was going to be changing and how they basically, and I've said this a million times, like they built it for the exact number of people like Lane Kiffin had on his staff, which was like one, uh, you know, recruiting analyst and things like that, not seeing how it was going to change because they're just kind of stuck in their ways. So you built this building that they didn't have enough room for the people that you need uh, for college football. So the new one should have that and, you know, having a second building, which they'll probably use, you know, John McKay Center for more of a multi-use, mm-hmm. not just football, things like that. Um, but yeah, so USC's, you know, new facility was like 12 years old, but it was kind of out of date, like right away, to be honest, like w- as far as it didn't, it didn't initially have enough uh, rooms, you know, offices for the pe- for how college football was adapting. And it's only getting bigger. So yes, I think there's a lot of that money pe- gets sunk into, we, we had new locker rooms six years ago. Let's get another one, you know, and, oh, let's put, you know, a waterfall and uh, um, gold-plated statues and a bowling alley and, you know, 
heated helmets and all, whatever you're going to do. Like just, there's just sink a whole bunch of money into perks. And I think, was it Maryland's coach that came out and had that, the cool quote about, um, you know, they just finished like a brand new we facility. Just, Maryland just finished a, uh, yeah, new, what USC is building a new football dedicated building. And he had some kind of quote, like, you know, that's great, but we'd rather give money to the student athletes. They, they, they'd rather change in a trash. I think the quote was they'd rather change in a trash can, uh, and get money themselves as opposed to like having like better right. locker rooms or whatever. So Sounds like Maryland makes some good points. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds Who's like the coach there? What's the coach? Mike Loxley. Yeah, I think it was Loxley that said that. So smart guy. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. So I think let's it's question time. We should do mailbaggy stuff, right? Yeah, we have a lot of questions. We have a lot. So why don't why don't we do this? We let's, already burned half an hour. So I know we burned half. That. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back and we're gonna just do mega mailbag palooza on here. So back in a minute. All right. We're back here. We are back. I got a plenty of questions on my tweet that I sent out this morning. I'm sure there's plenty in the chat. What's going on with the chat, by the way? Oh, you, know you, what? Have, you haven't said anything about the chat. I've had put some stuff on the chat. I did forget to mention this. Let me put this up here. So you guys might be familiar with Allison Felix. Um, he's got like a million. You can see all the medals there if you're watching on YouTube. But uh, yeah, the, the track field is now named after her but i went to uh, west coast sports associates gala on what day was it i don't know sunday uh, i don't know this weekend um and it was honoring uh allison felix so they've had some really cool this is like the 30th year or something of it or 28th year roy firestone is the, the the mc but they've honored like some really powerhouse uh people in there let me pull it up um but yeah, there's a bunch of people you would know. I saw a bunch of people from uh, USC there. Uh, they had the Trojan Marching Band there. But some of the people that have gotten this award, Jim Brown, John Wooden, Sugar Ray Leonard, Wayne Gretzky, Howie Long, Cal Ripken Jr., boom, Chris, uh, Arnold Palmer, Steve Young, Hank Aaron, Jack Nicholas, Pete Carroll, Andre Agassi. I mean, there's, you know, Kershaw's on there, Charles Barkley, uh, Carl Lewis. They did two track guys in a row, uh, track people in a row. But it was cool to kind of hear Alice and Felix's story and stuff. But I just wanted to give a little shout out to them. It was fun to uh, attend that event. Uh, really nice gala. I went to two like galas in a week, Chris. I had, I had to put on like a sports jacket twice. You're a gala man. Apparently, I don't I don't wear uh, those kind of clothes very often. But I got two in a row. But it was pretty cool. Uh, check out hearing uh, Alice and Felix's story. Her talking about you know hiding her pregnancy for six months and running at night or in the middle of you know middle of the night so people wouldn't know she was pregnant, and her really pushing the um, the shoe companies to give maternity leave to uh, athletes because basically if you just got pregnant as a female track athlete they would just cut you off, and so um, she fought with Nike over that ended up leaving Nike but got the policy changed so it was pretty cool but anyway shout out to Alex Alex and Felix Alex and Felix. Uh, who uh, now the USC track is named after her. So. Well, there you go. Yeah. Sorry, I forgot to mention that one. For sure. Uh, are you ready for questions? I am ready, I think. Yeah. I got a bunch on Twitter. I'm not saying rapid fire, but just, you know, with some pace. Sure. A little we bit. Pace. Uh, I'm, I'm starring questions in the chat, so we'll, we have a few of those. But if you have, if you're listening to the chat, you want new questions, then put question and I'll put it in there and star it. A uh, question from the Dan, who actually met him in Vegas for the Pac-12 Championship. So oh, shout yes. out to the Dan. Super nice guy. Hope to meet you again. Based solely on workout videos, the strength development seems like it's taken a big leap, particularly in the defensive front seven. Are you guys getting that as well? It's one thing to think we upgraded defense because of talent. It's a separate thing to have uh, OBJ numbers backing that up. I would say, um, I mean, we're not there in the workouts. You can watch the videos. And most strength videos are going to look cool, right? Like, it's going to look pretty neat. I think more just talking to players. And you can talk to players in different environments. If you're asking them a question on the record in a scrum, you're probably going to get something positive said about whatever you're, you're asking about. So, um, that being said... 
workout videos are always, you know, they're just like every spring, you know, every summer, you got a new slate. They get you excited to see the guys working, seeing guys who look bigger, look more ripped, things like that. We've seen that in the past. And sometimes it's like kind of translated. Sometimes it hasn't translated. Right. I feel like last year it definitely translated. I definitely felt like they were a little bit stronger, a little bit faster. Like Ryan yeah. said, that they were guys that they needed to still still uh, strive to be made in that department uh, after the 2022 season. And going to spring, I felt like a lot of those guys made strides. Guys definitely look bigger. Definitely guys look stronger. Like the defensive backs, Solomon Tuliapupu looked like an actual defensive lineman, not a linebacker playing defensive lineman. So... I think with this staff, the strength and conditioning staff, you are seeing gains being made, and I think it's translating to the field. And I do have high expectations for this being, you know, a second kind of full year or a true full year for Benny Wiley and his staff. So I'm based on what I saw in the spring, I'm expecting more gains to be made throughout that entire team in terms of strength and and health and and speed and, and all that, those kind of things. So I am optimistic that this will be a stronger, faster, bigger team than it was in 2022, just from some of the stuff we've seen on those videos. Yeah, I would agree. And, uh, and what I was also going to say is when you talk to players in different environments, I happened, there happened to be a USC defensive player that was at the uh, Allison Felix uh, gala. And I got to talk to him, so, you know, just sort of off the record stuff. And, um, you know, what he thinks of, I asked him about the uh, the strength staff. And and when you get, you know, then you feel like you're getting more of a, a straight answer. And definitely, um, you know, we've heard a lot of positive things. And uh, sometimes it's just, you need something new. Uh, this player was a, a freshman last year, so they didn't, you know, he, he didn't experience uh, previous strength staffs or the previous coaching staff. Uh, but it was funny to hear him kind of talk about like teammates would say how different it was. Uh, you know, the Lincoln rally has taken over, but you know, got some positive reviews from their workouts. Now, right now they're doing workouts at uh, six, eight and 10 AM uh, doing these Benny Wiley summer workouts leading up into fall camp. Next question comes from broke homie, Matt. Uh, best meal you've had in an opposing city that you'll miss once you leave the Pac-12. Also, where are you looking forward to eating with the conference move? I actually don't remember what the restaurant is, but Shotgun put me onto it, and it's in Arizona. I think it's in Phoenix, but we've gone there every time we've done the road trip in Phoenix. I think it's called something diner, uh, but it's like a real late night spot. It's kind of in a neighborhood, and it's got great outdoor seating, and it's everything they get they make is really really good so i will miss that place and i'm i'm going to try to figure it out right now with my computer what it's called but we've been there a couple times with keely and i've gone with shotgun really great uh sausage uh gravy and biscuits so everything they make there is really really good so i will miss that place yeah i'm not great at remembering like specific spots but i would say um food scene i mean i love going to phoenix i'm going to miss uh that uh, there's a lot of cool stuff there. You know, I have friends that live there and everything. Um, you know, being in Seattle, that's probably going to be one of the ones that you would miss going up there because it's just a lot of cool stuff with the seafood and and everything. I mean, Portland's cool. Like, you know, and I, I, Boulder's an awesome spot, but I don't I don't remember like specific uh, places. But if you you, know, you go to Boulder, there's a lot of great like microbrews and things like that. So there's cool stuff I think all throughout uh, the Pac-12. Um, but yeah, I'd probably go like Seattle or kind of Phoenixy, uh, area. Um, but you know, they have good meals, all those places, but there wasn't any specific, specific place. I'm going to say I would miss the most as far as going there. I, I mean, I don't I'm know. excited I like deep dish pizza in Chicago. So I guess more opportunities to do that. Uh, uh, not just every other year for Notre Dame. Cheese curds in Wisconsin, Ooh. Tillamook ice cream in Wisconsin, uh, Bring Ryan to go get some crabs in Maryland. We'll yeah, go duh. early. I love, so I think yeah. that'll that'll be one on my I don't have a specific place in mind. But I love crabs. I like crab cakes and stuff. And oh it's one yeah. of my favorite things. Definitely cheese curd and ice cream in Wisconsin is on on my list. Uh it's called Welcome Diner. Welcome you know, Diner. Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. So that's the place I'll miss. Shout out to Welcome Diner. If you know 
Welcome, Diner. I've been there. You know what it's about. Uh, next question. Aaron Domingo. What was Lincoln Riley's best rated recruiting class as a head coach? Also, who would you say is a top talent that USC could land that seems like a long shot at the moment? Going to have to look up the first part of that question because yeah, I, don't, I don't actually know off the top of my head. But He had some really good ones at Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. he had some definitely top 10. I think there was a couple top fives in there. I'll look that up. But I would say top talent. I mean, locally, Aiden Breland, the defensive lineman from modern day who has just risen up the rankings as a top five or a, excuse me, a five-star prospect in the 24-7 sports rankings. And, you know, five-star defensive lineman right there in your backyard. There is, you know, not a lot of uh, going on between the two right now, but that's a player we think USC is going to try to push for during the season. It will be a, obviously they don't sign into December, so USC has some time. It's not taking an official visit, it seems, this summer. So USC will have that to kind of push for during the season, especially if you're like, hey, we're winning 10 games. Hey, we're in the Pac-12 championship. Hey, we're in college football playoff berth contention. So that helps. Why don't you come in, uh, take an official visit, see what we're all about. So that's a guy that seems like a long shot right now that USC, obviously locally, will have a chance to uh, make a play for down the line. I can look up these uh, Oklahoma recruiting, but I don't have that off the top of my head. I'll, while you do that, I'll read an email we got from Rich from gotcha. San Diego. Uh, he actually sent an email knowing that we were doing a uh, mega mailbag episode. He says, thanks for providing uh, yet another forum to talk USC football. Do you know what goes into how House of Victory represents or signs an athlete? The last football player I saw was Lake McCree. Why wouldn't everyone want to sign with them for NIL? And what's your take on San Diego State situation? This reeks of Pac-12 doing Pac-12 things. Rich in San Diego. Um, so I believe right now, House of Victory, it's uh, up to like 200 USC student athletes signed. Now they're focused on, like there's some student athletes that don't need it. Like Bronny James has, you know, he can get his own deals. Uh, he has 7 million Instagram followers. Caleb Williams can can do his own thing. Doesn't have many Instagram followers, but he has, um, you know, there's, there's a huge reach and, and a lot of that stuff. But in general, what these, a lot of these players are signing and they're like these contracts that say, hey, you're going to go make an appearance at this uh, children's hospital and get paid uh, this amount of money, or you're going to come to this booster event and then get paid uh, this amount of money. So these are contracts that house of victory can set them up with um either you know endorsement deals or kind of like charitable work charitable work that you get paid for so it's not just like there's blank contracts for for everyone um and you know i don't know how many athletes they plan to sign but it's not like they're going to sign everybody but they're you're si signing a lot of uh, the bigger names and I heard like a Juju Watkins is like huge. Like I think she has more Instagram followers than Caleb does. Um, and some of those, you know, they can do that really well as far as monetizing their social media feeds and things like that, but also getting um, these opportunities. And I think i mentioned last week, uh, Lindsay Gottlieb talked about, I've, I'm blanking on the player's name, but you know, she signed a, a deal with House of Victory and, and got some money and was just you know over the moon that 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 the USC fan base kind of thought enough to donate money that she would be able to take part in. So it's definitely growing. Um, the uh, House of Victory and how the the collectives are are kind of incorporating you know the student athletes and and opportunities to make money. But they do sign these contracts and there's you know stipulations of what you have to do uh, to get that money. Um, any thoughts on that? Or I'm going back to my question I was looking up, Lincoln Riley's best friend oh, okay. class. That was number four in the nation in 2019. Signed three five-star prospects, Jadon Hazelwood, Spencer Rattler, Theo Weiss. And that was a class they also got the transfer from one Jalen Hurts. So 2019 was his best class at number four. Multiple top 10 classes around nine and What eight, about with USC, six. like the, the uh, transfer class? Well, the transfer class specifically was high, but Say that again. The USC's transfer class uh, last year with Lincoln Riley. Yeah, that was number one in the nation. I but, mean, but it wasn't I, the overall. It was overall. No, I think. I, I mean, yeah, that was the overall ranking. It, it gets funky when you go back because we've only really started doing the composite ranking 
and the transfer ranking at this point. That composite ranking for high school was number six. That was the overall rank at number four. You're right. Thank you for clarifying that. So it gets a little weird because, you know, transfer class classes weren't kind of... They weren't incorporated. Incorporated. Then. Yeah. Yeah, back then. So... Yeah, it's giving him the over... Because if he had, like, the number four class at Oklahoma, but also got Jalen Hurts, like, it might have been higher, right? Right, because the, the transfer rank is only six in 2019. They only got four guys, but obviously Jalen Hurts should have been a five-star in the transfer <laughs> ranking. So, you know, it, it, it it's a little funky, but, you know, he has had a top five overall class. I don't think he's got a had a pure number top five overall class, a top five high school class, excuse me, when he was at Oklahoma, but he's had multiple top 10 classes. Yeah. And real quick, Rich, want to know about San Diego State. Yeah. So I was on Pac-12 radio this morning and we were kind of making some jokes about it, but there's like four days left until that changes. We, it was corresponding with our uh, 50% off sale at uscfootball.com ends the end of uh, June. The end of June, uh, the exit fee for San Diego State doubles from like 17 million to 34 million. Will the Pac-12 have some kind of deal in place? I don't know. We're going to do a podcast of champions show Thursday morning. Uh, so I assume there'll be some kind of deal announced soon after that. But yeah, that, nothing yet. It does seem very, um, it just seems very strange. I think San Diego State's played this really well most of the way or all of the way until this. I think they've kind of misplayed their hand on this one coming out with those letters and everything. But um yeah, I, I think they're eventually going to join the Pac-12, but if they don't announce something before the end of the month, it's going to cost a lot more money, or they maybe just wait a year, and they have to come in 2025 instead of 2024, which I don't think would make a lot of sense, but it's Pac-12, so that's that, that's where the sense might be. I have a question from Drew. Will USC baseball go back to their old uniforms that you see all the recruits wearing now? We need those back ASAP is referring to uh, the white ones with the uh, the Trojan script on it. I'm not the baseball guy. I can't tell you anything Either about I. that. But That's they do they do question. they do look cool though. Uh, always always love a good script jersey. So I mean, yeah, I don't have any insight on that. I I apologize. But you're making it public that you're on record as saying uh, you want them back. Uh, TL TLXZ Flicks. Uh, interesting name. Will we see a whole new rebranding either this year or next with Big Ten logos on the jerseys, the field, the Coliseum? Will the flags be changed to the Big Ten school from Pac-12 schools? Will, US, will USC scrub its Pac-12 history? Well, I will say definitely not going to happen this year. No. It will happen you know, when they're actually in the Big Ten. I'm sure there will be Big Ten logos swapped out all over the Coliseum, get rid of the Pac-12 yep. uh, logos. Uh, I would assume they're going to go put in the Big Ten schools. Yeah, that makes sense. You don't have the Pac-10 schools up. Uh, will USC scrub its Pac-12 history? No, probably not. I mean, that's obviously a big part of USC's history, playing in the Pac-10, the Pac, whatever number it was at that time, Pac-8, Pac-10, whatever. It's a big part of it. They're not just going to scrub that history. I'm sure we'll see some Pac-12 stuff around the program. Uh, but yeah, it's time... It, they will be upgrading with the logos, but definitely not this year. Yeah, and I would say my guess is the Pac-12 will still call themselves a conference of champions, and they will count all the national sure. championships that USC and UCLA won while they were a member of the Pac-12, even though a lot of it wasn't when they were a member of the Pac-12, like the stuff you know before the Pac-12 was around, you know, other versions of the conference. And I think the Big Ten will say, hey, now we ha our schools have won this many national championships. So, um yeah. Pac-12 definitely not scrubbing USC from its history no. is what you're saying. Or UCLA. JP, not five stars only, Jared, but a different JP says, when does fall camp begin for USC? We don't have a firm date on that, but it's going to start earlier than last year yeah, because late, of the week July. zero. Yeah, late July. Started the first week of August last year, so we're just working backwards. So probably the last week of July, they're, they're yeah. going to get going. Uh, Rusty Curtis has a question about USC defense. USC defense was ranked 94 out of 131 teams in team defense last year, allowing 29.2 points per game. What is your bold but base prediction for where the USC defense will land on these two stats? No wishy-washy ranges, no caveat, just your straight-up informed expectation. What were the two stats he gave? Uh, 94 out of 131 
in team defense and 29.2 points per game. Yeah, so team defense kind of sucks. Um, it's not a great metric. Yeah, but using it, um, I, mean, I could see USC being like, my guess, will be, I'll go like 55. Yeah, I was guessing like 55, kind of 60 range. So that's my guess. And then points per game. I don't know what that was from last year. That would probably be like 24 points a game or something. Or like, or is it less than that? Say that again. How many points per game, like total team defense, would that be? Like, if, like, um, let me see. But 29 points per game obviously is a lot. I think they're going to be at least a touchdown better. I was kind of thinking around like 20 points per game, 21 points per game. You have a massive influx of talent upgrades. You're better from a strength standpoint and a size standpoint. And look, it's college football. You got, you know, the 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 the, the stud playmakers. You got Bear Alexander. You got Eric Gentry. You got Keon Bars. You're bigger across the front as a whole. Your secondary is bigger. I think you're at least better than a touchdown. I mean, I think I'm looking around like 20 points per game allowed by this defense, which I think would be a huge upgrade. I'm trying to look, find it. Uh, total defense, total offense. Total I'm going to be honest. I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. Uh, no, like, yeah, I'm, I'm saying like if you were 55 in the country, what would be your, how many points would that be? Like from uh, last year, I see what I'm you're looking, uh, I'm trying to find it. I don't know if they have that stat on this page that I'm on, but. Um, yeah, I would think in the low 20s or something, but to get like in the mid 50s is probably pretty good. Um, if you look at yard total defense, where was USC? Let's see. It's going to be at the bottom, I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Uh, Isn't USC. it like 129 or something? No, Georgia Southern was 129. If you remember, like this guy, Clay Hilton. Uh, USC was 106. Okay. 423 yards per game so let's say so from 423 if they wanted to go up to number 55 where umass is that would have to they would have to get down to 370 yards per game i think that's doable yeah so i think that would be sort of makes sense uh, so i don't have the points there but um yeah i i think getting in certainly the top half and you know you're if you can get in the 30s 40s you know, I think that's in, in some of these other categories. I think you look at more like advanced as like yards per play and things like that. I think that makes more sense um, than like total yards or total points. But I think USC and, and a lot of those categories, USC was in the hundreds. Um, so you need to get back up there. I think top half and Caleb Williams stays healthy. You're going to the playoff. Honestly, I feel like that's the thing. But yeah, you know, the defense could get better than that. And I think that's what uh, USC fans are kind of waiting to see. Eric Burns says, where do you think USC will end up ranked after the early signing period for recruiting? Ooh, Eric, you're putting me in a tough spot. I got to look all the way into December. I don't know what the win total is going to be looking like in December. I don't know if they're in the college football playoff. Contention, look, if you're in the college football playoff contention, I would say easily a top five class. Yeah. I'm going to guess six. I'm just gonna yeah, six I was going to guess six or seven. That's I, I think it'll be top ten, but, you know, there's so many factors that could make it a top five class or maybe, you know, round eight or, or nine. Six or seven feels safe. Uh, again, long ways away. Things that happen in June, you know, things could change very quickly in December. So I will say six or seven. Yeah. Ryan's I'll also go. saying six or seven. Your, I mean, your point about, like, there's not like, there's not like a couple obvious five stars that are already committed, you know, that you kind of base the class around. They're sort of like putting great pieces together, but not with the, you know, the, the crown jewel or two. Is Five-star juice, I'm saying. Five-star juice. There's not five-star juice, and there's not obvious five-star juice that, that's going to like, you know, there's not like the Juju Smith Schuster's like sitting there waiting to commit at some point, you know. Yeah. Um, so, but if you have a really good season, then you could, you know, do some five-star juice flipping, right? You can probably get some guys. De La Cruz says, which cilantro boy knows the most Spanish? Mm. Ryan, who do you think knows the most Spanish? Uh, I think you, because your girlfriend speaks, like took more Spanish and speaks Spanish. But Gerard doesn't do a lot. He does not a lot. I would say Gerard knows more. Really? I took Spanish in high school, got like 
straight A's in Spanish, but not much stuck. I know a very, very little. Gerard grew up in Southern California, so he already has an inherent advantage in knowing more Spanish and being around more Spanish. So, I mean, I'll ask him on the show what we record tomorrow, but I would go ahead and say Gerard Hurricane knows more Spanish than me. I used to make jokes with Gerard, like, I think I'm more Mexican than you are, man. I would just eat more Mexican food. I'm like, my Spanish was not good, but I'm like, his wasn't good either. So I'm like, oh, I could compete with you on that, which is funny. Johnny Velasco says, can we get more insight on Greg Brown, the defensive analyst, as well as Bookie, the other analyst joined in January of 2023, and the newest addition to USC, Bryson Allen Williams, and what, what, what might we see different with those additions in the 2023-24 seasons? Fight on. Yeah, so all these guys are, like you said, defensive analysts. They're, you know, it's not necessarily like, oh, they're going to, these specific people are going to make the defense better. It's more so like these people, particularly with Greg Brown, obviously he's a longtime defensive coordinator. He's worked under Saban. He's been in the SEC a while. He is one of those guys where he is just here to give his point of view. He looks at it from a different angle. You know, he's been around football a long, long time. He knows things, you know, he knows more than most guys have forgotten about. Or he's forgotten most yeah. things about football than most guys know. He's one of those guys. So he's just there to offer his opinion. He's be like, hey, this is what I think. You know, just, just offer different insight and just have another football mind in there to help work things out look at film, game plan, stuff like that. The other guys, you know, Bryson, Al Bryson Allen Williams and, you know, Bookie Riley Hiles, those are guys, those are young guys who are just trying to cut their teeth in coaching. You know, this is where they get the opportunity to get their hands on, work with guys. These are just guys that will help the position coaches. You know, I'm assuming Roy Manning, he's going to be working with Roy Manning, Bryson Allen Williams, and their edge rushers. They can, you know, more hands is always a good thing. You know, yeah. you can you can split groups up, make them smaller. You can get more detailed uh, coaching going on. That's why it's good to have Josh Henson have, you know, Zach Crabtree. with. They can split the interior guys and the tackles. And then Henson can work with the tackles. And Crabtree can work with the interior guys. Or Henson can work with the center specifically for this day of practice. So it just gives them a bigger, a uh, better opportunity, excuse me, to get more hands on, get more intimate in their coaching. And obviously... When you have that, that's just a better result on the field. You know, you guys are going to learn more. They're going to understand it more. You can break it down. You can spend more time working on it when you're working in smaller groups. So that's what those main, these guys are here for. That they, They're just an extra pair of hands to help run drills, you know, break things up. Just let the coaches get more hands on with their players and, you know, not have to deal with, you know, uh, 10 guys. You know, you can break it down to smaller groups and, and just, and so with that, you know, you will see, Better technique, you know, you're, or at least that's the hope. You see better technique, guys soaking up more in, in knowledge. So they're just an extra pair of hands. And then with Greg Brown, just another mind who has been around football to uh, offer his opinions. And, you know, he's been around the block. So he knows, a, he knows a thing or two about football. Yeah. I think just having guys like that, too, they can reach players in different ways. There's different circles that they're a part of, different colleges they were associated with, different yeah. seven-on-seven -seven teams. Like, there's just – it's just more and more, like, tentacles out there connecting to recruits. Uh, USC is back to Cruton is his name. Uh, okay. USC football name. is benefiting from premier academics, upgrades in coaching staff, transfer portal, NIL, and hopefully now the announcement of new facilities. What else can USC do to annually pull in a top three class? Anything else besides winning a natty? No, I would say no. Winning a natty or coming close to winning a natty, playing in your conference championship – those are the things of a healthy program, and that's what kids want to see. They don't want to go to a, a team that's 8 or 9 like USC was. They want to go to a team that's winning 11, 12 games a year and is in the conversation and is on ESPN and is being talked about for the playoff. So, yeah, I mean, winning a natty, obviously, but just even being in contention for the natty, being in contention for the playoff, that builds buzz. You can sell that like, hey, we, we just need you to get a little bit closer. We need you to get over that hump and actually get to the national championship and win the national championship and bring, quote-unquote, USC back to where it's been. So, yeah, the only thing you need in there is, is winning. You know, continue to win, continue to put up double-digit win seasons, and, yeah, the kids will take notice of that. To me, it's, I mean, winning, obviously, winning is great, uh, and it's important, but I feel like with USC, you have 
a lot of built-in advantages. And just being a competent, you know, run athletic department, uh, you know, a competent uh, coaching football coaching staff, you're going to have good success with that. Even if some of the win, you know, if you lose some close games and don't make the playoff or, you know, miss out on the Pac-12 championship, the way Lincoln Riley's assembled the staff, the recruiting um, support staff, every everything, and the way they recruit, you're going to be successful. USC is a viable option. It's a uh, nationally noted program again. So even if you have a, a tough year, I think USC is still going to be recruiting at that level, mostly because of the infrastructure you put in. You know, you have this amazing, you know, the, the food analogy, like this is an amazing restaurant, awesome location, and you had like a Denny's cook in there, and now you bring in a Michelin star chef. And yeah, maybe you have a, you know, the soft opening doesn't go well, whatever it is. But you now have the facility, the the great kitchen and the the awesome location and it's an affluent neighborhood and all that. And now you brought in an amazing chef who's now hiring a, a, an amazing staff. He's got great sous chefs and all that stuff. So you just put your, okay, they're going to get, you're going to get people coming into that restaurant. It's going to be, it's going to do well. Maybe it's not the best restaurant, you know, in the city or maybe it is, but you are now bringing in, you're in that t conversation. So I feel like that USC is now taking the potential that they have and all those inherent advantages you have about being uh, the kind of school that USC is in the location it is and the, the affluence around it, the uh, putting guys in the NFL and all the history and all the tradition and the trophies, all that stuff helps you in recruiting. And now getting, uh, you know, the, the last step was really getting the elite alpha head coach and you have that who's putting the elite staff together and support staff and all that you put all that together and USC is going to have uh, consistent success recruiting and you can get over the top with that you can get top classes one two three if you couple that with winning uh, next question comes from Juan Wick which a name I love is USC recruiting the state of Hawaii not Really, you know, they have a guy who has, you know, ties there and Sean Nua, but not really. You know, Lincoln Riley and that staff have not really hit Hawaii hard. You know, I'm not saying not really, there's no. not talent there. I just think there is not a, a lot of players that they want to target and, you know, put those resources into recruiting. So I'm not saying they're going to be uh, shunning the state of Hawaii. I just think there's no prospects that have caught their eye out of the island. So. You know, USC and Hawaii have always been a – had a good relationship. The They've got a lot of players from there. But as of right now, no, it does not seem like they're uh, focusing on Hawaii. DMV seems to be taking more uh, priority there. I know. It's disappointing, right? No one really wants to recruit the DMV, but I guess that's where we are. Sorry. Uh, draft, <laughs> Giraffe D says, what are the odds uh, Coach Lincoln Riley grabs a Heisman caliber transfer prospect before the 2024 season? Interesting. If they definitely, if they don't take a quarterback in the 2024 class from the high school ranks, I would definitely see them looking in the transfer portal to see a bring in a QB. Because obviously, as we expect, this will be Caleb's final year. We'll see where they are with Miller Moss and Malachi Nelson and those guys moving into the Big Ten season. But yeah, I would not be shocked if they went after a transfer, high end transfer in the 2024. Class and if Lincoln Riley gets a high caliber guy, I think they're automatically considered a Heisman kind yeah, of guy instantly. Yeah, you're you're a candidate. You know, Spencer Rattler gets recruited to Oklahoma. He's a Heisman candidate. You know, boom. Um, I got a bunch of stuff in the chat too. And the okay, ones, let's and run the, through some chats. The, the one in the document are those ones that you those had? were from my DMs. Okay, did those you from my DMs? Did you read those already? I have not? not gone through these. But you want to you want to do a couple of those? Or you want me to do some chat? Uh, ones? Do some chat ones. All right, let's do some chat ones. I'll do the ones that we we got a lot in the chat too. Holy cow! Okay, um, let's start with let's run through them. Johnny, yeah, we'll try to do these rapid fire. What's up, guys? Uh, what to ask if USC going to the Big Ten makes a difference uh, to the recruits that we are battling against Oregon? It does. I I like to ask that question, like how much did the Big Ten influence your decision? And they're like, yeah, really much. I wanted to play in front of big crowds. I wanted to play all over the country. I wanted to play at Ohio State. I wanted to play Michigan. So yeah, definitely, definitely an influence. It helps. Uh, you're kind of leaving one of them behind and like, would you rather, 
oh, I'd go to Oregon and play in the Pac-12 or 10 or whatever without USC and UCLA, or I could go. So yeah, I think it definitely helps. Um, Bucky Dent or Ducky Bent, which Ducky is cool. Bent. Uh, where's the homie Jack? Jack's calling a baseball game. He's games. got an internship. Yeah. Another internship. He'll be back when the school starts again. So I think probably in August or sometime. I believe we'll he's see. in San Luis Obispo calling games for their minor league team up there. Yeah. So yeah, he's 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 doing a summer summer thing. So let let him let him do a summer thing. Thanks, Ducky. Uh Aaron says, Have you seen a month like this with commitments? Not in a while. And I've said it before, this feels like, you know, old February signing day in terms of Bang, bang, bang. They're, they're going bang, yeah. bang, bang. And this should be a fun week because USC has five prospects that have scheduled their commitments for this week. So, and there may be a couple more surprises, not scheduled guys, not scheduled commitments. So, yeah, at least five guys are coming off the board this week and USC is involved with all of them. Yeah. Big, uh, USC was number 57 in the country starting the month. And number now, eight. Now number eight. So, it's been pretty crazy. Let's go to John. Uh, he says... What is the exact difference between an official visit and an unofficial visit? And what can USC provide on an official versus unofficial? Official, they basically pay for everything. They pay to fly you in. They can put you up in a hotel. You know, all bring the food. Your, bring is, family members. Bring your family. Yeah, so you can bring I, – I don't know how much people, but I've seen people bring at least like four people. So you, you can bring you and your whole family, and they put you up in the hotel. They pay for all your food. They take you to Nobu. They pick up the check. You know all those things. They put you on a yacht, and unofficial. You they don't pay for anything. You know you get there on your own dime. Yeah. Uh, they, they give you a tour and they all. They give that you fun. a tour. You take a photo. You do the photo shoots and all that. But you know they can't really. Uh, they're not whining and dining. You. They're not whining and dining. You. They're not picking up the check. You know they're kind of like sliding that check over to you. Like yeah. Yeah, that's you're gonna get that one. But uh, unofficial. But official. They're like right here. Don't worry. We took care of it kind of thing so yeah man on the moon says uh any tailgating in maryland next year hell yeah yeah we're definitely gonna do that at least a bar takeover we'll do a bar take yeah we'll do something um for sure i think all the this is 2024 not yeah. next season you know that's it's following season but yes we're gonna do some cool stuff at all of the big 10 venues so yeah uh marcus raison davis is looking huge is he, he is. I, I, is this going to be his breakout year? I looked at him and I was like, that looks like a NFL dude who just came back and visited. Yeah. He's looking big. Uh, will it be the breakout year? You know, you, you hope it is because a lot of people want to see Rajon Davis and that speed and athleticism hit the field. But, you know, there's Mason Cobb there. There's Shane Lee there. There's Eric Gentry back healthy. There's Tacka Curtis. It's a crowded room. But I am hoping because I think he, I think he can help this defense. I think he can help this defense. We'll have to see in the fall. The early fall is going to tell me what I need to know. Yep. All right. Tay Bidness. Uh, what are Chris's thoughts on a recruit film reaction and breakdown segment on the uh, podcast live shows? Interesting. So, like, throw the uh, the film up and we kind of talk about it? I guess, like, when I put up the uh, Ryan Pelham stuff, we could talk about, you know, like, say we were both at an event or you and Gerard were at an event and you filmed uh, one of the dudes and... You kind of put it up there and talk about, yeah, this was a play where blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Maybe. Sure. Yeah, we could explore that. I mean, we do have a lot of video. We take a lot of video during the season. Obviously, it has to kind of time up with uh, the commitment so it's relevant. But, yeah, we could we could explore that. I know Gerard loves to get into film and break down film, so I think he would be part of that. Also, Shotgun, too. Yeah, I like that. Ross V, how are we looking with the big Cali guys in 2025? Jordan Davidson, Nasir Wyatt. Madden uh, Farimo, uh, Marcus Harris, Noah McHale, etc. Uh, really good for a lot of those guys. I don't think Marcus Harris has an offer from USC yet, but you know Madden and Noah USC has made them a priority. They're recruiting them very, very hard. Those are obviously national recruits, and USC would love to keep them home. So USC's doing a very good job with those guys. Get them on campus. Get them around the games. Noah McHale has been to. USC like 900 times. So they're they're doing their part in getting him to come back, come back on campus. Uh, I'm blanking on the first person just said. Nasir White and Jordan Davidson. You know, USC is, I would say, the favorite for Nasir Wyatt. A really good edge rusher out of modern day. 
Jordan Davidson, you know, USC maybe has to do a little bit of work there, but they're they're definitely up there. I know Texas is looming big for him, but they are outside of Marcus Harris, who does not have an offer. USC is right up there with uh, in the top three of all those guys. Uh, if you're watching us live on YouTube, thank you for that. Or you're watching the replay on YouTube. We are putting up the uh, YouTube chat questions up on the screen, so you can read and see your uh, comments. Or if you're watching later, you can see those comments. So we appreciate you doing that live with the show. Eric, as a media company reporters, do you have uh, anything planned to say goodbye to fellow Pac-12 colleagues? Have you made inroads into meeting, making media relationships with the Big Ten colleagues? So, like, are they going to do, like, a Tim Teslon thing where they uh, give us a standing applause out of every away game? Yeah, I don't think that's happening. I don't think so. Um, me being doing this a long time, I have good... Uh, connections with a lot of the Big Ten media people uh, already, at least in like kind of our industry with the 24-7 sports, uh, people that I chat with. Um, you know, maybe I was with them when we were at Rivals or at Scout or that they're 247 now, wherever it is. Um, yeah, and then obviously close relationships with the people that cover the Pac-12. I do a podcast, the Podcast of Champions. We don't know what we're going to do with that. Uh, if we're going to still do a, a Pac-12 podcast, even though... USC usually wouldn't be there. Probably not going to happen, but yeah, because it does take a lot of work and we don't get really paid for that. So, uh, but I do like covering. It's a labor I, of love. It is a labor of love. I like covering the, the conference and, you know, maybe we do something like that for the Big Ten. Um, and uh, yeah, I think trying to make more inroads, I will uh, be attending Big Ten media days this year. So I'm going and, you know, that will be a place to make some inroads. I know, you know, one or two people that like kind of work uh, in the Big Ten offices. So I'd like to meet more and kind of build those relationships. But yeah, so that's starting um, this year. I was going to go last year and uh, I think I got sick or something. So I ended up going. But um, yeah, I'm going this year. So I'm going to Indianapolis for a couple of days and meet some people. Should be good. Uh, Ryan loves meeting people. So I do like meeting people. Kevin uh, says. Is there a connection between Mike Bones' resignation and our rush recruiting uh, of recruiting commitments? No. No, I don't think there's a connection. Not at all. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, he says, uh, the schedule at the end of the year is brutal. Do you think we can come through unscathed? I don't know about unscathed. It's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, whatever the defense is, if the defense is like – Really good, yes. I think that could be a positive. I don't think they're going to be really, really good. I think they'll be yeah. better, but I don't think you can get out of that unscathed. I see one law, at least one loss in there. Yeah, I think I'm. My prediction this year is probably going to be eleven and one again for USC. Um, the first six games are not, you know, you're like the Nevadas and the San Jose States. I think Cal and Stanford are both going to be god awful. You get Cal later in the season, which is nice, but all around that Cal game is Notre, you know, at Notre Dame, uh, Utah, uh, at Oregon, Washington, and UCLA. So it's a tough crew, and there you get that Cal game is sort of like your bye week. I think Cal and Stanford are going to be hot, hot garbage for the Pac-12. <laughs> uh, but the beginning of this, the schedule is like Arizona, Arizona State, like Arizona State, new, you know, Colorado, new staff. Arizona, USC took like their three best players. Arizona, you know, I think there's more potential with Arizona. Oh, come on. Not their best player. I mean, T-Mac is still an Arizona Wildcat. I love yeah, T-Mac. Yeah, but three of them, their best players, yeah. <laughs> three of their five. Let's say three of their five. Yeah. Uh, but so, I, yeah, I think probably a loss in that later half. But I don't see them losing in the first six games and then probably losing one of the last ones. But that's just my prediction. Andrew, who has a better season, JT Daniels or Keaton Slovis? Keaton Slovis. He's at BYU, right? Yes. And he's going – What? where's – JT now. Mm, I don't even I don't remember know. where he is. He was at West Virginia, and then he went somewhere else. I think yeah. it's like a Utah State kind of school. I don't know. Okay. I honestly don't know, but I'm going to say Keaton Slovis. Because right. BYU usually has good good seasons. Yeah, they're, they're the Big 12 now, so that'll be kind of fun that is true. to watch that. Touchdown USC says, what impact will Cliff Kingsbury have on the offense this year? I think it's mostly just working with Caleb Williams, working with the quarterbacks. Working like, with the quarterbacks. That's what USC lost from last year is the guys that were working with Caleb had gone, two different guys. Uh, and Studying defenses. Obviously, he's an NFL guy, so he's been, you know, seen a lot of football too. 
And just again, another brain to pick. Oh, rice. Another... Everyone's saying rice. He's a rice. Rice. Yeah. Rice. Maybe. Am I disrespecting rice by calling it similar to Utah State? I feel like they're kind of on the same group of five. Group of five. Yeah. I, I think I'm okay. But yeah, Cliff Kingsbury, again, just another guy, obviously a high level guy who has been a head coach of the NFL, been head coach in college, knows a thing or two. Just, just another guy to give their opinion and thoughts. And when they're watching film, be like, hey, what if we did this? So yeah, I think. Obviously, the offense is in good hands with Lincoln Riley, but just having another voice like that, uh, respectable voice like that, Cliffs Kingsbury, can you know maybe get a couple, squeeze a couple more points out of that. Yeah, Carlos and the AD news. Uh, uh, I mean, I you gotta be a subscriber. A big, man. I, Go I, over I posted to a big the war room, a big update in our last war room that people seem to like, but. I will just say it just seems like they're, you know, kind of going through the short list right now. Just got that list of, you know, I mean, I don't know how long a short list typically is, but I think they're just kind of going through their their list right now. You know, a lot, not a lot going on uh, with that, but I think they're just being methodical in their process. Yeah. And uh, we put some stuff in the war room every week. If you're not a subscriber, 50% off right now. Don't miss it. Um, let's go to Fight On uh, MC. Uh this is the last season of the Pac-12 for USC. When will you at the Peristyle start doing your stu uh, study homework about Big Twelve football, uh, Big Ten football? I mean, uh, I'm going to the Big Ten media days. So announcement. He's getting a. Should I put out a press release for that? No. Yeah, uh, it's. I mean, you you follow college football and you kind of know. You know, Chris knows Maryland, so we have we have connections there. Um, I mean, he said about Big Ten schools. Is that what he said? Yeah, football. About football. Yeah, I mean, I'm familiar with the Big Ten because my team, you know, kind of gets the crap kicked out of them every now and again. But they had a good season last year. But, yeah, I mean, we're we're already, like, aware of that. You know, we, we cover college football, so we're, we're not unfamiliar to the Big Ten. But, obviously, we'll be focused more on it. You know, second of the season is over, and the Pac-12 is uh, probably, like, the second the Pac-12 championship ends. <laughs> Where were we? Where we? That weird Airbnb that had like the three different rooms. Uh, was Wh that? Uh, was that the Bay Area? Or was that? No, that was. Wait, was it? That or was, was it? In... Corvallis, maybe. Yes, Corvallis. Corvallis, it was Oregon. I think there was like uh, Maryland was playing like Penn State or something, or Michigan. Maybe it was Michigan and like beating yeah. them. Yeah, they, we they lost watching? by a touchdown. Yeah, they lost yeah, by a touchdown. It was like close. It was like yeah, you know, seeing Chris. They Washington. didn't make that interception. Or didn't have that interception, they would have uh, they would have beat him. Yeah, it's terribly tragic. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Harry. I got a few more, and then we can get back to your other ones. Does Washington and Oregon follow USC to the Big Ten? Yeah, I don't think um, soon. I I think there's going to be a big shakeup in college football. I don't know if that's going to be the case. I don't think USC wanted Oregon to come along. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that's happening. I don't think we're going to see more shakeup anytime soon, until unless the the Pac-12 TV deal goes to crap and then it's a free for all. So then maybe something like that could happen. But uh, yeah, let's go to Terrence. He says, uh, "How was Elijah Golden in the elite camp? And thoughts on his recent offer?" Elijah. Oh, Gordon. Gordon. I'm sorry. Sorry about Elijah that. Gordon. Yeah, he was good. You know, ran well. I think he. They said he ran a four four. Uh, really long kid. Really good frame. And you know, he, he's a guy who can play cornerback or safety. Play next to Christian Pierce at Rancho for for who signed with USC. So, yeah, he's got a. He's he's kind of a. I don't want to say late bloomer, but just a guy who's developed kind of sl slowly and and you know had that nice little steady development and now he's you know on the verge of blowing up. And, you know, I love to see that for, for kids. You know, there's a lot of kids who are anointed when they're freshmen, but it's nice to see also those kids who are just like, have that nice steady uh, build, like, you know, like a CJ Shroud who kind of blew up his final year. Jane Daniels blew up his final year. Yep. Those IE kids come around uh, at the end there. So yeah, I think Elijah Gordon could be a good one. It was an interesting offer just because USC seems to be doing really well for defensive backs, but Maybe that means they, there's a defensive back that uh, 
they thought they were going to get there. They're not. Or they just really, really like him as potential and they want to grab him for their class. Uh, a few more. John, uh, Chris, can you give your opinion on Ty Anthony and Miller coming to USC? Well, Draylon Miller, the four-star wide receiver out of Silsby, uh, Texas, seems to be kind of trending to Trex A&M right now, or that's the latest buzz for today. And he's supposed to commit on Thursday, so USC maybe has to make another little push. But I still like USC for Ty Anthony Smith. They are good friends. Um, I don't think they're necessarily considered a package deal, but it's Anthony Smith and USC. I still think they're they're really good spot. You know, USC seems maybe have lost a little bit of momentum for Draylon Miller, mm. but I don't think they're kind of a package deal. But yeah, all right. Uh, but they're both really good players. If that's kind of what he wanted from, uh, no, I think they they were some talk in the chat. Uh, there was uh, someone that was saying like they're not going to USC for sure, and then, then people are kind of fighting and stuff. But sure. Anthony Green, uh, so since we aren't taking a quarterback this year, is the plan to get one in 2025? I don't see many options in next year's class. 2025? Well, if you're, believe, if you're a subscriber to the theory that Juju Lewis, the uh, number one player in 2026, is going to reclassify to 2025, well, I tell you there will be somebody there <laughs> who actually just took another unofficial visit to USC this past weekend. That's Juju Lewis, the number one quarterback in 2026. Rumors he's going to reclassify to 2025, and that would give USC, obviously, a big chip for 2025 in that cycle. So there may be someone there, is yeah. what I'm telling you. And one last one, Ted Barber Jr. Is there a deadline for the Pac-12 to announce a media rights deal? Uh, there's not. I mean, essentially, in like four days, today, you know, being June 27th, on July 1st, it will be one year until USC goes Big Ten bound and UCLA goes Big Ten bound. Um, usually these media rights deals are wrapped up, uh, at least a year out, you know, sometimes. So the, the closer you get to the end of the, your deal, the uh, probably harder it gets to get a new one. I would think, you know, you're still plenty of what, you know, a year is fine, but, um, we do have an artificial deadline with uh, San Diego state being added. If you want to add them in, uh, the, you know, the cost would double on July 1st, but that's really the only kind of hard deadline outside of July 1st, 2024, when the media rights deal is over for the current one they have. And if you don't have a new one, then you're probably in a bad, bad place. So yeah, I would say the hard deadline would be when the deal's over, which you want to have something signed before that deal is done. Okay. I got like four more. Uh, okay. Giovanni says, which freshman gets the most reps in 2023? I would say Zach Branch because of offense and special teams. I like it. Uh, we have, excuse me, one from Jonathan. Who will make a bigger impact on defense, Lucas or Bear Alexander? I mean, Bear Alexander has more like on-field success, but they both have a lot of upside. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go Bear Alexander. I would also go Bear Alexander, but they're both like, just look at them. They're both like dudes. Like yeah. this is an SEC dude. This is like an NFL dude. But I will say Bear slightly just because he has that uh, already prior experience at a high level experience at that. He also asked, uh, if USC makes the playoff with one loss, who do you think they will lose to? I will go with Oregon. Yeah. Just because it's on the road, really tough environment. It's going to be a freaking war in there. But I would say Oregon. And I know a lot of USC fans don't want to hear that. But No, I think out of Oregon is going to be the tough one. It's later, you know, in that stretch. Um, you know, you get you go to Notre Dame, but it's, you know, kind of after the early you know, uh, tomato cans that USC is playing. Basically, if 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 it goes the way I think it's going, like USC is going to have a, a pretty easy go at it through the first part of the schedule. Now, all things could go wrong. People getting injured, like you know, defense could still suck. Um, but I feel like they're going to go through the early part of the schedule, just knowing the Pac-12 teams that they're playing that are in you know a lot more turmoil than USC is, obviously. And you get Notre Dame early on the road, and I'm not sure how good Notre Dame is going to be. Um, this year, we'll see. You know, lose Tommy Roots, whatever. Like, but getting into the meat of it, you know, Washington, I think, is really good. Their defense is going to be better. They can score a bunch of points, but it's going to be in the Coliseum. And then uh, Utah, again, is going to be in the Coliseum. And I think USC will be, you know, double circling that game. So the, the one obvious one that seems like would be tougher, you could say, you know, UCLA, but um, I don't know how good UCLA is going to be. They're breaking a new quarterback and all that. 
the one that you know you get your quarterback back and all that is Oregon. But I'm a lot. I think I'm a little higher on Washington this year than I am Oregon. But just going to Austin is going to be you know when that is in the schedule. I think it's going to be tough. Final question: Anthony N. L. A. says, "Which stadium are you most looking forward to visiting in the Big Ten, and separately, which city are you most excited to visit when traveling for the Big Ten? I would say uh, Michigan, the Big House, yeah, and Ann Arbor. Uh, I know it's a really good college town, and I'm looking forward to experiencing that. I would also randomly say to visit Lincoln, Nebraska. I know that's weird, but it's such a you know storied program and Obviously, they love their Nebraska football, and I just want to go to Lincoln, Nebraska for, yeah, for whatever reason. I want to experience it. Interesting. Yeah, a big house is one I've been to. I've been to Nebraska, and that's a great venue, and I've been to Ohio State. Um, I haven't been to Penn State. I think that would be awesome, especially yeah. if they do the whiteout. But I feel like the big house for Michigan is the one you kind of have to want to go see. Um, I think Madison might be, like, a good choice for, like, you know, just seeing like the college town and everything. I think that would be fun, a fun one to kind of go uh, and check out. So no one said uh, Rutgers. No one wants to go to New Jersey. Not so much. I think Maryland Shotgun. would be fun too. Yeah, shotgun's there. Uh, you know, my sister lives uh, close by in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, so it would be fun to kind of go there. And we, we'd always like go into, we go in Annapolis or go check out different places in Maryland and, get crab cakes and stuff. So that'll definitely be a fun one. But I think going to like Madison will be cool. And obviously the big house will be awesome. Sweet. Is that it? That yeah. Got? I mean, that's pretty much all we got. We didn't really have much. And we have like an hour and a half show still. So um, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in to this edition of the Peristyle podcast. I think someone asked composite two-star recruits podcast will be coming out on June 28th at midnight. That's a Wednesday. Tomorrow, uh, if you're watching us live. 29th. Is it the 20? No. Today's the 27th. Tuesday. It's coming out the 29th, Thursday. Comes out Thursday at midnight. Okay, well, I guess it's, yeah. You said the 28th, that's well, Wednesday. It's the 28th at midnight, but then it turns <laughs> to the 29th, whatever. But it'll be Wednesday night, like late. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, ready to take our photo? Oh, yeah. What kind of photo do you want? Uh, so they have the laptop here. I want to, like, be peeking. Okay. I'll take my glasses off for this one. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll just smile then. I like doing the smile. All right, well, that's going to wrap things up. Uh, make sure you check out all the content over at uscfootball.com, 50% off, like I said. For Chris Gervinho, I am Ryan Abraham. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Thanks for tuning in wherever you're watching or listening, and we will talk to you next time.